as they make their way that way. Um, teachers will meet them over there. If you, if you have a child that's not uh, going to children's worship and they'd like to go today, um, then they're more than welcome to. You can walk them over there if you want to, or they'll take them off your hands. And uh, either way, it's okay. And you can uh, sneak back in with us. Uh, while they're making their way out, go ahead and pull out your Bibles. Turn to Philippians chapter 3. We're going to continue on uh, right where we've been for the last uh, three months or so. And uh, today, we uh, will finish out chapter 3. So we're, we're, we're down to the last chapter after today. And uh, as we step into um, September, into the fall, we'll finish up Philippians, and then we'll go a different direction after that. I, I will say this. Um, I think Philippians has been really good for our church. It's been good for me. I think that um, it's, it's an encouraging letter from Paul. I think he's um, over and over, he's, he's, he's saying, stick with this, um, commit to this, uh, honor God with your life, uh, don't give up, uh, all these words of encouragement. And uh, this morning, we find ourselves uh, looking at two verses right here at the end of chapter 3. And, uh, and I hope our hearts uh, just connect with this word today. I hope it, uh, my prayer, like I prayed earlier, I hope it doesn't go out void. I hope that God really teaches us through this because these two verses, verses 20 and 21 in chapter 3 of Philippians, it's, um, it's some words straight to believers. And if you're, if you're in here this morning, and, and I always, uh, I, I never assume that there's not, I always think there are, uh, if you're in here this morning and you're not sure uh, if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, if you're, not, uh, if you're not positive that you would spend eternity with him, then I don't want you to feel left out this morning. These verses are directly uh, connected to the believer. These, these verses, uh, Paul's talking to those who know Christ. And so if anything this morning, if you don't know Christ, I want you to see what you don't have without Christ. And I want you to see that, that Jesus Christ loves you and that he gave his life for you and that he has a better plan for you and he has more. Amen? Um, and, and those of us who, who know Christ, uh, we know that in our hearts. And um, so, so let's let this minister to us this morning. I've entitled the sermon, Home, Hope, and Change, because those are the three things that Paul talks about in these scriptures. And you'll see what I'm talking about as we go along. Here it is. Um, if you would stand with me, let's stand for the reading of God's Word this morning. We don't do this every week, and there's not a rhyme or reason to it other than sometimes God leads, and, and, and we'll do it to honor Him. Um, I don't think we have it on the screen this morning, and that's okay, but here's, here's how it goes. You may have a different version, and you... Well, look at that. How awesome is that? Let's read it together. Philippians 3, verses 20 and 21, it says, But our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's stop right there and let's give God a hand. That's an awesome thing to think about. Speaking of Jesus Christ, verse 21, let's read this together. It says, Who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself? You can have a seat. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. Lord, let it, uh, let it change our hearts, let it, uh, let it mold us, let, us, let it shape us. We pray this in Christ's name. First of all, let's go back to the beginning of verse 20 there. And let's talk about the first point. If you're taking notes, there's a little place to take notes on the back of your newsletter. If not, maybe jot it in the index of your Bible or take a mind note or something. But first of all, Paul talks about our home. Um, when Paul writes to the church at Philippi, he, he mentions there at the very beginning, he said, but... Our citizenship is in heaven. Um, now, let me, let me explain this. Paul was using a concept that they would have been very familiar with in their days, in, in, the, in the lives that they were living. And here's a little bit of history, not to give you a whole bunch, but Philippi, Paul was writing to the Philippians, right? That's why it's called the book of Philippians. He was writing to the people of Philippi. And Philippi was under the control of Rome. Um, it was a colony of Rome. Uh, and so the Philippians were citizens of Rome, even though they didn't live where? Talk to me. They lived in Philippi. And so they, were not, they, were, they, they didn't live in Rome, but they were citizens of Rome. And so Paul uses this illustration of being a citizen, 
but not actually living there because he knew that the Philippians would understand that. But Paul used it to contrast what we said last week. If you were here, if you didn't, you go catch that message online because last week's message was talking about those who, who don't know Christ, those who are enemies of the cross. And so Paul was using this to contrast that. And, and he's, uh, in, in the scripture this week, he's saying, if you're a believer, if, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ then your citizenship is in heaven. Um, each of us who know the Lord Jesus Christ, we have a heavenly citizenship. We don't live in heaven yet, do we? We're, we're here on this earth with, you know, in, in God's great creation, yet the, the sin of mankind and, and, and a fallen world. And, and so we're not in heaven yet. Our true home is in heaven. And, and, and we've talked about that a lot over the last year when we stepped through... Uh, when we stepped through uh, the books of Peter, the, the letters from Peter, we talked about that, how we're an alien uh, in, in a foreign land right now for believers because our home is in heaven. This is just a temporary time for us, a temporary place. Um, but that, that's what Paul is talking about. Our home is in heaven. Um, our home is not here. Now, let me, let me kind of say it like this. Um, how many of you this summer has flown by? Anybody jihad with that? I mean, some of you are like, what are you talking I mean, this summer has flown by, and I see kids out there that are about to go back to school next week, and they're like, you know what, you know, you know it. Um, but it has flown by, and, and I'm starting to realize more and more that it was not just an old saying, the older you get, the faster what? Faster time flies, faster time goes, whatever. Um, and, and those... Um, and so this summer for me has just flown by, and I've been on the go a lot, really more than most summers. Um, those of you that know me well, I like to, uh, one of my hobbies, I love to travel. I, I save up my money and I use it for that a lot of times. And, and everybody has their, their things that they, they do, but I, I like to go places and see new things. And, and, uh, and my wife gets on to me sometimes about that. She's like, you just don't ever like to be at home. And I do, uh, but I like to go, I like, anybody g haul with that? I like to go see places and, and, and do things. And um, but, but do you know what I like most about traveling as much as I like to go? And you know probably where I'm going. My favorite part of the trip is what? Coming home. I always eat, eating. Did you say eating? That's awesome. Yeah, I like that too. Um, have you ever been away from home for a while? And you just, you know, you're having fun. Everything's great. And maybe sometimes not so great. You've been on those kind of trips too where everything just didn't go like you planned it. Um, but, you, but you really look forward to getting home. I mean, I'm sure that's why Dorothy said there's no place like home. There's no place, you know. I mean, I know that's why. Um, it, it's fun to travel and go places, but it's a joy to come back to the comfort of home. And so listen to me. No, no matter how good or bad things may be here on this earth during this temporary time, these, these few years we've got here, no, much, no matter how much we enjoy our homes, Walk away at least with this today. It doesn't begin to compare to our, to our heavenly home. It doesn't begin to compare to what we have for eternity. Our citizenship is in heaven. Our eternal home is heaven. Here's a big question. Is your heart longing for home? As you walk through this life, are, are, are you more concerned with the stuff you're dealing with right now and the things your kids are doing and, and, and the things that consume life? Or is your heart set on home? And, and, and think about this. I mean, maybe, maybe there's, um, some of you would relate with this. There's been times in your life where you were away from home. Um, maybe you left, left home to go to college uh, for, for a little while, or you moved away with the military. And after a while, you had been there for a while, and um, the strangeness of being away from home kind of wore off. And you, you started feeling at home where you were. And I think that's kind of what we feel as believers sometimes, isn't it? Our home is in heaven. We're here for a little while, but we become a little bit comfortable with here. Um, we, uh, we, we, we start to think that this is what life's about, the, the here and now. But, but let's, take a, let's take a look at what the Bible says. I mean, the Bible says a whole lot about heaven. Now, here's something interesting. The Bible says more about hell. Uh, if you read the Bible, there's a whole lot more about, about hell in the Bible than there is about heaven. But the Bible does say a lot about heaven. Um, and, and I just want to remind us this morning, this, this is just a, a praise God session here, okay? I, I want to remind us this morning of what the Bible says about heaven. And this is not an exhaustive list, but this is, um, 
this should, this should get our blood flowing a little bit. Revelation 21, 3 and 4, it says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. Amen, church? And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, and the former things have passed away. And then listen to what... Um, these other passages from Revelation say. Revelation 21, 18 says, The wall was built of jasper, while the city was pure gold like clear glass. Revelation 22, verse 1 says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Revelation 22, 5 says, And night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or of sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever and that's just the beginning of it I mean, we can't um, we can't fully comprehend or understand the magnificence of heaven and I think that's probably why God leaves a little bit to the imagination for us to wonder and to and, and I don't know that we could I don't know that we could uh, comprehend it or handle it and it's a huge contrast to the destruction that will be at the end of time for the enemies of the cross like Paul talked about last week. So our citizenship is in heaven, and that's an incredibly great thought. As, as believers, um, we must walk away understanding that we are not supposed to be living for the here and now. A heavenly future awaits us, right, church? And, and as citizens of heaven, we ought to live with a heavenly outlook in mind. Matthew 6.20 says, Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. If you want to live life with an eternal focus, then you have to live it with your eyes on heaven and where you will be one day as a believer. Colossians 3.2 says, Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. Uh, so look at Philippians 3.20 again. The scripture tells us right there, it says, but our citizenship is in heaven. So first of all, that's what I want to walk us with. Simple, straightforward. We must walk away as believers understanding that we have to keep our focus on our home, on our real home, and that is our citizenship in heaven. Now, Paul goes on. Let's move to the next part. Paul goes on, and he, he goes a little bit further, and he reminds us of our hope. That's the second part of the message today. He reminds us of our hope. He says, but our citizenship is in heaven but look at what he says in the second part of verse 20. And he says, And from it, being heaven, and from it, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. From it, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you believe Jesus is coming again? I do too. I do too. You know, there, there, there are some that say, some that claim to even still believe in Jesus Christ but that say that he won't. Um, but, it, but it says, from it we await a Savior. Now, what is it? It is heaven. Um, and so the Bible's telling us here, not only should we be looking forward to heaven because it's our home, but we should, we should also be eagerly awaiting the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will come from heaven back to this earth one day. Um, so here it is, church. As believers, we have the return of Jesus Christ to look forward to. Several years back, I did a, I did a complete series on the end times. We did a, a series through Revelation, and we may go there again one day um, for those that haven't gotten to walk through that. But, but a big component in that, a big part of that is understanding that Jesus Christ has promised to return to this earth. Um, and, and, and the Bible here says that we await that. Now the, now, the Greek translation of that, it's a little bit different than understanding the English. In the Greek, it means um, it has a sense of eagerly waiting for Christ to return. And that's really what to await something means. But when we say the word await, we don't often think about it like that. Um, you know, when we think uh, when we think await, you know, you, you know, you're, you're standing in the line at McDonald's and you're thinking, if I have to await on this any longer, uh, you know, what's so hard about it, you know, or or or, or whatever. And uh, and and but this means to eagerly wait on something. Um, here here's the point, church. If we can't conjure up anything else to be excited about. As believers, and, we, and, and we've talked about this over the course of the last several months. We, we live in a day and age where, for whatever reasons, our, the cultural blend with the church, we've gotten this mentality that we have to um, 
how do I say it the right way? We have to be entertained to like church or we have to, you know, or this or that. Listen, if, if nothing can, can, can make our blood pump or make us excited uh, other than this, I mean, we, we ought to get excited about this is that, that Jesus Christ is coming again. That, 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 ought, you know, that, ought to be, that ought to be something on the forefront of our minds. Let me ask you this morning, are you eager to see Christ? Are, are you eager to see Jesus Christ? Um, or are you not so eager because you would be ashamed if he came back today? It's a big, it's a big question to ask. And, and then we balance that with the fact that we know we're supposed to be eagerly awaiting the return of Jesus Christ, but... There's a level of patience in our waiting. There's a level of patience in that. You see, because you, you understand that God's time is not our time, right? God doesn't work on a clock like we do. Um, we're, we're, uh, God, doesn't, uh, God doesn't do like we do at McDonald's when we say, um, you know, where's my Big Mac? I mean, God doesn't, God doesn't operate like that. A, a second's like a million years to God. A million years is like a second. Um, Think about it this way. Have you ever been so excited about something that you weren't very productive until that thing that you were excited about took place? And, and you may be saying, well, what are you talking about? Um, you, maybe, you, maybe you got impatient uh, and had trouble keeping yourself occupied, kind of like maybe you're ready to go on vacation. And, and you're thinking, you know, I, I'm excited about this trip and I can't wait until we get there and you're not very productive for the whole week leading up to it and you just kind of miss out on that week and then you get on the trip and you think, well, you know, I've, I've wait. and we even do that in the church. We've done that with the church at times where we, we become so event driven and, and we're trying to make a concerted effort at this church. Sure, events take place and events are necessary and we, tr we do things that are, you know, that are purposeful. Um, but but, but ministry is really more important, and it, it happens even in the church. We, we say we're excited about Fall Fest, or we're excited about Vacation Bible School, or we're excited about this mission trip, or we're excited about this youth camp, or we're excited about this, and we live from event to event, and we build it up, and then all the while we look back, and, and there's days and weeks that we miss in between actually ministering and doing the things that God has called us to do. And I think, I think the, the patience that's suggested here in the Scripture about serving the Lord while we await His return is that you have an eagerness, but all the while you're serving as if Jesus Christ could come back at any, any point in time. Um, and y'all have probably heard of groups that set dates for, for the Lord's return, and, and then they go up on a mountain and wait for Him, and they don't do anything, and, and, and then they miss their date, and then they go back and change it, and, you know, and, they're, and they're doing all these predictions that the Bible says not to do. Um, and that's not, the way to, that's not the way to do it. We're to understand that Jesus Christ promised he would return, and we're to be busy serving the Lord until he does, um, instead of growing impatient. And, 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 and so we, we, we begin to understand that. Luke twelve forty says, You must also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. So we eagerly wait for his coming by being ready for his coming. Um, let me, let me, I'm full of examples today. Let me give you another one because I want us to kind of think of some stuff that reminds us of our home, reminds us of the return of Jesus Christ. Um, at, at my house, and you, can, and you can probably relate, when we're going to have company over, um, it's natural for us to begin to make preparations. And those of you that know me well, you know that my preparations can be outlandish sometimes. Um, we, 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 uh, we start cleaning up right quick, but, but you know what I'm talking about. You start, you start chunking stuff in closets and you start uh, dusting places you don't normally dust and you mop and you vacuum and you, you, know, you, you make the beds and you, you clean the kitchen a little better than you normally do and, uh, and you prepare food and people are coming over. Um, and so you get things in order so that when that company comes over, you're not embarrassed and they don't think that you live like a pig, right? You know what I'm talking about? Um, now, on the other hand... If your house is a disaster um, and, and it looks like that disaster has recently hit and you don't have much food on hand and you're not prepared, everything, you know, clothes are laying out everywhere um, and you're not prepared for guests, then it's natural to kind of hope in the back of your mind, man, I hope nobody shows up today. I hope nobody shows up unexpectedly. And don't misunderstand me. Any of you are welcome at my home anytime. 
Um, and, uh, but, but you know what I'm talking about, where, where you just, it's kind of, kind of sloppy, and you just hope nobody comes by that day. Um, but, we, uh, but, but the point is, is we prepare when we know folks are coming over. Um, so we need to get that concept spiritually. If it's true that we are eagerly awaiting our Savior, then we, get this, we are going to be preparing to meet him, aren't we? We're going to be preparing to meet him. We're going to have our spiritual houses in order. We'll want, to, we'll want deep in our hearts to be found living lives that are pleasing him when he returns rather than him finding us in dishonor. So that's the next big question. I'm full of them this morning. What in your life right now, put your thinking cap on, put your heart hat on, what in your life dishonors God? Straight up. You don't have to yell it out. Think in your mind. What dishonors God? If you're just being honest, you and God, what dishonors God? Last Wednesday night at Wednesday Night Live, at the end of our session, I had everyone in here um, either write out or make, a, make mental notes of the known sins in their lives, the things in their lives that they knew just were not honoring God right now, the things that were holding them back from being who God wants them to be. And I shared, I shared with, the, with the group that night that uh, I had done that exercise earlier in the week, last week. And, you know, and this, is, this is pastor being open book. You know, I, I, thought, um, I thought, man, you know, I, I know, I know there's three or four things, very evident things that I struggle with and, and things that God's working on with me. And, and it's, you know, you know, sin struggles and things that I, I don't want to be there and I want to honor God with this and I know that God's going to use me more and I'll be a better I'll be a better dad I'll be a better I'll be a better pastor I'll be better a better child of God by by walking through these things and getting them behind me and, and honoring God but when I really sat down you know I'm thinking three or four things and God's God's certainly worked on my life a lot over the years and God's moved me from this to this and and boy my struggles aren't near what they used to be but when I really got honest with myself my list of three or four things that I'm struggling with and this is pastor being open book my list of three or four what I thought would be three or four turned out to be 18 18 things you know when I got really really honest with myself and honest with God what in your life right now dishonors God would what would you be ashamed of if Jesus Christ came back right now. Do you eagerly await for the return of Jesus Christ? Are you preparing yourself for his return? William Barclay said this. He said, the best way to prepare for the coming of Christ is never to forget the presence of Christ. Everywhere you go, everything you do, every thought you think, every step you take, Every breath you take, I know that's a song, every breath you take, every step, whatever. Everything you do, everything, God knows it. God knows your heart. He knows your motives. He knows your thoughts. He knew them before you ever knew them. The best way to prepare for the coming of Christ is to never forget the presence of Christ. You're not fooling God. Isn't that true? If we're constantly aware of the presence of Christ, we'll be watchful about the way we live, and then we'll be prepared for his coming. As believers, we have a tremendous hope, don't we, church? We can live in expectation of the Lord to return, and that's a great source of encouragement and hope, living in the midst of a sin-filled, fallen world. Corey Ten Boom said, this was after the war. She said, we are not a post-war generation, but we're a pre-peace generation. Jesus is coming. Are you looking forward to that? To that day when Jesus comes again because he will. So we have our home and we have our hope. That's the return of Jesus Christ from our home, from heaven to take us. And then the third thing, we see it in verse 21. And I love this. Verse 21 talks about our change. Our, transforma our transformation, our change. Verse 21, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, it says, Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. Aren't you glad if you're a believer you're going to be like Jesus one day? Amen. By the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. By the power that enables him even to subject all things 
to himself. Now get this, this is a little bit hard to understand, but as believers, we look forward to a time when our physical bodies that we dwell in here on this earth will be transformed and changed. Some of you are like, hallelujah. <laughs> Me too. Things, things, as you get older, things don't stay where they used to, do they? See, um, think, about, think about TV for a while. Think about television. Um, we know that we're living in, a, in the midst of a, of a culture on TV right now that's uh, kind of the reality show craze, right? And we've been in it for several years. That's, I mean, everything on TV has become that. Everywhere you look, there's some kind of new reality show springing up. And, uh, and then every time one starts, there's a network, another network copies it, and they do something real similar to it. You know, you, you start with American Idol, and then you got all these other, you know, shows. And then there's the makeover shows. They, you know, they go a step further. You know, there's, there's home makeovers and room makeovers and, like, people makeovers, you know, um, where they fix people's teeth and their, and their hair and they give them plastic surgery and then they, you come out and there's like a whole new person, you know. Um, so all these reality shows. Um, and, and there's even stuff like the, the show Ice Road Truckers. And, uh, and Josh and Crystal and Isaac and Ella had a mission team from Athens that was in Peru with them serving in Chacas, which is those of you that have been there, it's, close, it's fairly close to San Luis where they are. It's one of the towns that they're over. Ice Road Truckers came in and did a show on the Punta Olimpica, the, the road that we, one of the roads that we take to get there. It was rated, um, it was rated by National Geographic at one time as the second most dangerous road in the world. Um, and, uh, and anyway, they did this show from, from uh, those of you that have had, like, kids go to Peru. You didn't know that. We don't never tell you that before we leave. Uh, <laughs> and so we just hope we won't have to say it out, you know. Um, but <laughs> anyway, but they, uh, they came in and did this show, and it, it was literally a makeover. I mean, they come in, and they, they, they stage a bullfight. They, they pay the town to throw a fake festival and do all this stuff. And, and, uh, and they, they, wanted it to, they wanted it to look authentic and real and, and all this stuff. And they even got on to Josh. They were like, why are you here? We don't want any Americans in the, in the film. You know, and, and of course, if you know my brother, he's fairly stubborn, even more than me. And he was going to get in. He was going to get on that show. And uh, and you can see him there at the bullfight, and you can see him standing by the fence, going like the you know in the background of the shot he got on the show. And and uh, Crystal and Isaac did too. But um, but but the, and I'm talking about the reality shows and the makeover. But listen, there is nothing. Um, there's nothing compared to the transformation that is in store for us as believers. Um, and we can't fully comprehend it, but what we do know is that the Bible says that we will be given a glorified body like that of Jesus Christ. No longer will we be subject to physical limitations and problems that we experience here on this earth in our current bodies. Disease and sin takes a toll on the bodies that we inhabit on this earth. But one day we'll be given a glorious body, a body fit for heaven. Um, 1 Corinthians 15, 35 through 49. Uh, I don't want you to get lost in the words of this, but I think, it, I think it's vital to understand because Paul had talked about this with the church at Corinth. And I want you to listen to what he said. So just kind of listen through this. This is 1 Corinthians 15, 35 through 49. It says, But someone will ask, How are the dead raised? What kind of body do they, in what kind of body, with what kind of body do they come? You foolish person. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. And so, so Paul is saying, What you will become one day, this doesn't, what you know now doesn't even compare to that. Um, but God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same, but there's one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is of another. So he's explaining really the difference, um, but I think he's getting in on the fact that he made human beings unique and special. God created us for a purpose. And he's saying, you're, you're going to receive another kind of body. There's, there's one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars. The star differs from the star in glory. So it is it with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. 
In other words, this body dies, but one day we'll, give a, we'll be given a body that will never get sick again. We'll be given a body that won't die again. Amen, church? It is sown in dishonor. It's raised in glory. We've dishonored God with these bodies. We've walked in sin. We chose to sin. We turned against God. It's because of us that Jesus Christ died on the cross. Thank you. Not for me, but for God. Because of us, Jesus died, but because he loves us, he rose again from the grave. And the, body, and the Bible says that we will be given a body that's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness. You know, we depend so much on ourselves. We are weak, yet he is strong. It's sown in weakness, but it's raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It's raised a spiritual body. If there's a natural body, then there's also a spiritual body. Verse 45 says, Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. You see, in other words, we walk through this, but we have the hope of Christ to come, don't we? The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. And the last verse says this, Just if, as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. We're going to be made to be like Christ. Our bodies will be transformed. We, we have this to look forward to one day, is that we will be transformed our, we'll receive glorious bodies, and there's a lot to that. We know that the Bible says that, um, that when we die, you know, when we die this physical death, if Jesus Christ doesn't come back before we die, and, and, and remember, God doesn't operate on our time clock. He may come back this afternoon, but it may be a thousand years from now, and that's like nothing to him. It seems like forever to us. But we know that if we die... If we know Jesus Christ, the Bible says that to be apart from the body is to be what? To be present with the Lord, okay? The body's buried in the ground, the spirit, the soul, who you really are is present with God. But the Bible also promises us that when Jesus Christ comes, to bring the spirits of those who have gone to be with him to come back, and that the dead in Christ shall rise, the body will be raised up, and it says the body will be transformed and met with the Spirit, and, and, and your spirit will be given a body that will dwell for eternity, a body fit for heaven. And said, so, what about those that know Christ that haven't died yet? And, it's, and the Bible tells us that those in Christ will not be left behind, but they'll be raised up and transformed instantaneously in the air. And that's, that's a simple version of it, a lot more than that. But listen, the point is, is that, that God can do that. He, can, he, makes, uh, he makes all things come to himself. The scripture says that it enables him to subject all things to himself. One day when we get a new body, the blind will see and the lame will walk. The deaf will hear. Amen. Our bodies will be glorified and our souls sanctified and we will be able to enjoy perfect fellowship with the Lord. That's, that's an awesome day to think about. That's an awesome thing to think about. And God can do that. And you say, well, how can it be? I can't explain it, but God can do it. The scripture says right there that He's able to subject all things to himself. God can do it because he's God. He can manage the whole universe because he made it. He can do it. And so here's the deal this morning. Christians, we are at a crossroads, I believe. Is, is our focus on heaven and laying up treasures there? Are you purposely serving your king and looking forward to his return? Are you filled with hope and looking forward to the day when your body will be transformed and conformed to his glorious body? Or are you too focused on the here and now? That's the crossroads we are at. I'm going to close with this story. It'll take just a minute, and then we'll be done. But John MacArthur wrote of a man whose name was Focus, and some of you may have read the story of Focus before. It's not like F-O-C-U-S. It's a man named Focus, P-H-O-C-A-S. Um, he lived in the 4th century, and he's been revered through the years as a precious saint of God. He lived in a place called Asia Minor. And he uh, lived in a city uh, called Sinope. And he had a little cottage outside the city gate where he grew his garden. So kind of get that in your mind's eye. The whole story of the man is recorded by one of the ancient bishops. And somehow it's found its way down through history. And the story goes something like this. 
It says, travelers passed his door almost hours of the day and night as they went in and out of the city gate. And by the holy ingenuity of love, he stopped as many of them as he could as possible. Were they not weary? Well, let them rest themselves sitting in his well-tended garden. Were they in need of a friendly word? He would speak it to them in the dear master's name. But then quite suddenly, one day, life was all changed for focus. Orders went out from the emperor Diocletian that the Christians must be put to death. When the prosecutors entered Sinope, they were under orders to find a man by the name of Phocas and to kill him. About to enter the city one hot afternoon, they passed in front of the old man's cottage in the garden by the gate. And in his innocence, he treated them as though they were the warmest of friends, begging them to pause for a while and rest themselves. And they consented. So warm and gracious was the hospitality they received that when their host invited them to stay the night and go on their way refreshed the next day, they agreed to do so. And what's your business, said Focus, unsuspectingly. And then they told him that they would answer his question if he would, would regard it as a secret. Well, it was obvious to them by now that he was a man that they could trust. Who were they? Why, they were the soldiers of Rome searching for a certain Focus who was a Christian. And please, if their kind host knew him, would he be so good as to help them identify him? After all, he was a dangerous follower of Jesus about whom the Christians talked, and he must be executed immediately. And I had to stop and pause there in the story. Boy, we as Christians, we're dangerous, aren't we? I thought about the prayer rally and the, you know, and the prayer uh, caravan and all this kind of stuff. We're just a real threat on society, aren't we? I just say we're offering the only hope that society has. And so uh, it says, and so Focus, speaking of himself, he says, oh, I know him well, said Focus quietly. And by the way, he's quite near. Let's attend to it in the morning. His guests having retired, Focus sat thinking, escape? That would be easy. He had only to leave under the cover of darkness, and at daybreak he could at least be 20 miles away, and he knew fellow Christians who would give him hospitality by hiding him, and when the persecution had passed, he could reappear and once again cultivate his little garden. The decision to flee into safety or to stay into death was apparently made without struggle or delay. We can only imagine what he was thinking. Out of his garden, focus went, and he began digging in the middle of the night. Was there any earthly thing loved better than this little plot of ground? The odor of the hummus, the fill of the soil, the miracle of fertility. What were his thoughts as he went on digging in his own garden? Well, there was still time to run away, but he, re he remembered that the Savior didn't run. He didn't run from Gethsemane, and he didn't run from Calvary. Or perhaps he thought of his fellow Christians to whom he might go for rest. Would not his coming endanger them? And as for those executioners that were now soundly sleeping under his roof, they were, after all, only men who were carrying out orders. And if they failed to find their man, their own lives, likely as not, would be taken, and they would die in their sins. So deeper and deeper focus dug. Before dawn, he was done, and there it was. He had dug his own grave. Morning came, and with it, the waking of the executioners. I am focused, he said calmly. And we have it on the word of, Christian, of, a Christian, of the Christian bishop who recorded the story that the men stood motionless in astonishment. They couldn't believe it. And when they did believe it, they obviously were reluctant to perform an execution without mercy on a man who had shown them nothing but mercy. But it was a duty, he reminded them, that they were required to perform. And he was not bitter at them besides... Death did not terrify him. His heart was filled with the hope of heaven. Toward them, he bore nothing but the love of Christ, and moments later, it was all over. The sword had done its work, and the body of Christ's love mastered man lay still in the stillness of death in the garden that he loved so dearly. That's recorded from John MacArthur, Reaching for the Prize, Part 4. I read that this week, and it just reminded us, it just reminded me, and encouraged me to remind us this morning that boy we get caught up in the here and now so much don't we we um 
I don't know how much, honestly, we really are focused on the return of Jesus Christ and on the fact that our home is in heaven and not here. Um, and the fact that we will be transformed one day. We let the things of this world consume us, and God wants it to be so different for us, church. So the questions again, are you looking forward to a new home in heaven? Are you living a life that reflects the, the hope that you have? Are you faithful in sharing your hope with others who need to hear it? Are you ready for a changed body, a transformed body? Paul's reminding us that we are truly blessed in Jesus Christ. I guess the point of the whole thing this morning we need to remember what we have, believers. We need not forget how truly blessed we are to know Jesus Christ, that he saved us out of his grace, that God did it. We didn't do it. We, did, we, we didn't do anything to earn God's love, but he, he did that out of his grace, yet we get so focused on other things. And if you're not a believer this morning and you don't have that, Look, I'm talking to believers about us just remembering what we have and being focused on the right things. But if you don't have that at all, then I want you to see what you're missing. You're missing eternity with Jesus Christ. Go back a couple of verses and don't stand as an enemy to the cross. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you this morning. And Lord, we, uh, as we enter into a time of invitation, um, Lord, as we sing a song, as we... Um, as we kind of close out the service here, God, would you, would you just move in this place, God? Would you, would you take my, uh, Lord, just my, my humanly attempts, God, my, just to, to share your word, God, I, I'm not worthy to share this. No one in this room is. Um, God, we just try to do the best we can to, to share it. But God, would you, would you take us out of the way, God, and would you let your word penetrate our hearts and change us god would you um would you do the things that only you can do lord would you would you save the lost lord would you bring revival upon your church god would you pour out salvation and lord would you uh, remind us as believers lord of what we have in you god just grow us deeper stretch us further make us who you want us to be lord Find us falling at the foot of the cross, saying, Lord, I am barren and I am bare. And I don't have much to give, Father. I, I, don't, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't, know, I, don't know, I don't have all the answers. But, Lord, you do. Lord, would you take over? Would you, would you lead me? Would you lead us? Lord, like, like Will and the guys saying earlier, Lord, give us clean hands and pure hearts that seek after you. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Lord, that's who we want to be. I know that's who we want to be. But we've got to take our focus off the here and now. And we've got to put it on these eternal things. We've got to put it, Lord, on our hope that it's Jesus Christ. We've got to put it on heaven, which is really our home. We've got to put it on the fact, Lord, that it's not going to always be this way. Lord, that you will transform us and you will change us and you'll make us fit for heaven for eternity. And there we will be with you forever and ever and ever. And we will be able to worship you forever and ever and ever in your glory and in your majesty. God, we praise you this morning, Lord. You are the King of kings and you are the Lord of lords and you are the great I am. Lord, you're the maker of heaven and earth. You're the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. And we praise you in this place. We pray that you would be glorified as we sing and as we make decisions, as we worship, as we pray. We put it in your hands. Amen. Church, let's stand and let's sing with Will. Hear us one more time. And, uh,